Well, hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. And if you're a new listener, my name is Aaron Brockett. I'm the lead pastor here at Traders Point Christian Church, and I am joined by Ryan Bramlett, who's had a bit of a hiatus. You've just come back off paternity leave. Is that how you say that? Sounds, paternity leave. Sounds good to me. I was uh, say paternal, but it's yeah. paternity. No, I uh, was out for a few weeks. We have a brand new baby girl, Holland Jean, who's doing amazing. But yeah, man, had to. You were getting a little too comfortable without me on the show. I watched the past two episodes, your girl stole the show. Then the next one, I'm just like, I got to get back there before he takes this off without me. So it's good to be Yeah, good I'm be like back. Justin Timberlake in sync. I'm just going to go solo. I was thinking Beyonce. Like, I, I'm <laughs> Destiny's Child just kind of falling off to the wayside. But Is baby sleeping okay? I know you said that she was maybe struggling a little yeah, bit. Yeah, um, she's colic. Um, so we have, this is our fourth kid. Never ran into this before. So mm. those that have had one of one of these with that it's uh it's <laughs> it's a time they're just you just can't console them so it's just crying and crying and mm -hmm. crying um but the good news is uh the silver lining is most of that usually happens early in the evening so by the time it is time for bed she sleeps about as good as you can expect okay. for, for a newborn so good it's good. going well yeah yeah well great mm -hmm. well we this season have been talking about influence and uh that really go coincides with the just the theme of the podcast shift the gravity we want to shift the gravity of whatever room that we walk into mm -hmm. and so i'm joined by two of my favorite gravity shifters that's mm -hmm. the first term by the mm -hmm. time i've ever used that coin it uh tony and jason and uh thank you guys for being willing to jump on the podcast tony this was kind of last minute we asked you just like last week to come yeah. on and yeah. you were willing Absolutely. So thank you. Yeah, here I am. Yeah. So both of you guys are involved in Life of Our Church. You're not on staff, but you are deeply involved in our church and have been for a number of years. So mm -hmm. why don't you tell us, uh, tell our listeners just a little bit about who you are, your family, and the types of ways that you serve within our church. Yeah. So uh, I'm Tony. I'm married to Rob. Um, there is now a teenager in my home as oh, of two wow. weeks ago. So How old is she now? Cammie's 13. Mm. I'm praying for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm. I need it. Um, so we actually, I get to serve with her um, in kids ministry. So that's been mm. something new we've been doing for about a year and a half. Mm. So we serve in the first grade classroom, which is awesome. And then um, lead a women's group. And this summer I got to go on the Traders Point local mission trip. So that was awesome. 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 Wow. Yeah. So a few things around mm. the church. Yeah. So did, didn't Cammy do that with you? Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Pretty eye opening. It was good to see just like the need locally mm -hmm. and realize in your own backyard, yeah. you know, there's just a lot of opportunity for us. So I was yeah. grateful that we got to that as a family. Yeah. So wow. yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Jason, what about you, brother? Jason Cold Iron. Um, I get to serve on safety. So yeah. you'll see me sometimes hiding in the shadows behind Aaron and, and uh, Ryan. Mm. I intentionally um, try to like make people mad just to see if you get into a fight. Well, I think so, it'd be great. so the rumor is you're willing to take the first punch. And <laughs> that so is I, true, I, yeah. I, I've, I've never to said that. I don't want to get punched at all. So. so the interesting part is my wife Jennifer's on staff, and we talk about this take a bullet. Mm. She's okay with me taking one for Aaron. Oh, mostly okay with one for Dang. Ryan. I'm mostly okay. Mostly oh, okay. Like to the leg or to the arm. That's you fair. Know, flesh no. wound kind of deal. Mm. Um, I also get to serve as ministry partner, which is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with Allie Bryant working on strategic alignment. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. That's been a just an awesome way to get to dive in and share some of this executive stuff that I do professionally inside the church. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And for those listening, how would you describe what is a ministry partner? So I've been told there's two kinds. Mm. Uh, one is the kind you kind of give some ownership to. Mm -hmm. So they get a piece of something and they, they own it from start to finish. The other is kind of the consultant role. Mm. So that's kind of the more the way I, I interact with Allie, just mm -hmm. more of a consultant role. Mm -hmm. It's been, I mean, it's phenomenal. Mm. You get past the place of being able to serve with your, your time and your treasure and also give back the, the, the experience. Wow. It's just, it's a great program. It's a great program. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you doing that. Yeah. It's always fun to talk a little bit of leadership with you on Sunday yeah. mornings as, as we're, you know, in between services. As I'm trying not to offset you while you're trying to get ready for your mm -hmm. message. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That never happens. Yeah. That never happens. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about your vocational journey, guys. Like, uh, what have you done? Um, what are you currently doing now? Mm. Um, tell us a little bit about that. You go, you're supposed to go first. Okay. Mm. So uh, 21 years now. Um, serving in the marketplace uh, in some form or fashion. I spent the first 20 years, two decades, uh, really with one company, which is kind of unheard of, mm -hmm. but three generations of the same company, a uh, global multi-billion dollar organization, and got a chance to live in five different places. Um, we spent four years actually in England, which was mm. life-changing for our family in many ways. 
And um, did you ever get a English accent? And so, do you still have it? <laughs> I at times might have used some British words. Um, my husband would give me a hard time about it. Yeah. Um, what would you say? Yeah. What would you? Use? I mean, <laughs> like toilet, loo, you know, oh, yeah. the mm. usual stuff. Um, yeah. I actually started thinking like a Brit, mm-hmm. so that was interesting. Um, but my daughter was three when we moved and started school like two months after. And so she learned how to read, write everything Mm. in in England. Mm. And so she had a really strong accent. And I'm grateful for for iPhone videos because we can go back and there's proof. Oh, wow. wow. But like two months after we moved back to the States, she completely lost it Mm. and won't even do it if I ask her. Mm. So, anyways. When we lived in Kentucky before moving here, (laughs) seriously, like Campbell was five or six yeah. and she started developing like a Kentucky accent yeah. she'd yeah. say y'all all the time mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah it was wild we were like we've got to move <laughs> <laughs> we gotta get out so of here southern Indiana sounds the same way <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so we moved back to the U.S. in 2017 and um, yeah I just continue to have a lot of success um, in working in uh, agriculture industry mm-hmm. and just grateful for so many different opportunities. But um, in March of 2021, I did something that everyone tells you not to do, which is leave a job without having a job. Mm. And I took uh, what I'm calling my corporate sabbatical because, you know, marketplace business women and men, we should get sabbaticals too. So um, I spent about a month just discerning what was next. And uh, now I am a entrepreneur and I work and do leadership consulting. Um, with executives and boards, and I mm. absolutely love it. Mm. So that's where I'm at. Mm. Yeah, and that's been exciting to watch all of that. I've mm-hmm. had a yeah. little bit of a seat. Yeah, mm-hmm. you have, you have. And actually, I was thinking about this. <laughs> um, when we were in the UK, I thought, well, maybe I could preach one day. So mm. I did that twice, and you graciously like read my sermons. You gave me critique. It was really helpful, though, to kind of discern, like, is that something I want to do? Mm. And then more recently... When I left, um, you know, we had a great conversation mm-hmm. last April, and it was just very uh, informative. I think a lot of individuals, business leaders, marketplace, nonprofit, church leaders, you don't really fully understand, I think, what you're capable of until you're willing to take a risk. Mm-hmm. And so when you surround yourself with people who are for you and are like, hey, you know, you got this. And mm-hmm. what's the worst that can happen? You go back and you get a big corporate job or mm-hmm. whatever. But um, yeah, thank you for taking time and, and, and exploring that and giving me some guidance in it. It's yeah. been, it's been re- pretty remarkable so far. Yeah. So it's been, I'm excited for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah you're incredibly yeah. gifted. Mm-hmm. It's just the way you think, but in the way you communicate. Thanks. And it's always, I always feel sharper after talking to mm-hmm. you. So thanks. It's been great. Yeah. Thanks I would echo that. Here. Tony's been a, a big confidant for me too. Um, last 15 or 18 years have been executive leadership in a couple different roles. A lot of it was built in the energy utility business. Mm. Um, I get to lead a company now of about 200 people. Um, it's a, it's a fantastic group. Um, the most interesting thing was right out of high school, I went to work for a penitentiary. Mm. So like, I know I can see that. Yeah. Tattoos yeah. make sense now. Yeah, I didn't sure. get them in there. I just worked there. At, like sure. it wasn't a, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but so that was really formative on the, like just cultural side it's Mm. a totally different culture Mm. um and it 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 took me from a small town kid rural america and placed me in a place where i was a minority and i'm having to learn lots of new things and there were there was a guy i'll never forget the guy his name's ronald sesson he was 55 when i started there so he would be 75 now Mm. he just took me under his wing he's like hey here's some things you shouldn't say here's some things you should say and Mm. that just transformational relationship was it was just fantastic and so mm. i carry a part of him through mm. every decision i make and that guy I, I don't know if he knows how much he poured into me at 21 mm. but it was just phenomenal so i've had a lot of executive leadership stuff but there are some things that were super formative um, mm-hmm. and they always bring me back to my roots so when you see me in the safety role it's just something that's kind of built into me oh, it just it yeah. just mm-hmm. it's just part of who i am mm. so that makes a lot of sense yeah And I would imagine that all of us, you know, when it comes to our vocation, the thing that we're doing or contributing to the world, there's the, what we might call like the professional preparation, whether that's the classroom Mm -hmm. or, you know, some sort of a program that we go through. But I would say where where this really comes to life is like what you just said, somebody that's um, older, 
more experienced, takes the op- time and opportunity to invest into you. Absolutely. I'm so grateful for that. I was um, recently, I had a, a former elder of the very first church that I started in when I was 24 years old, uh, right out of Bible college, super green, all vision, no wisdom. Yep. <laughs> and actually not a lot, not a lot has changed. Um, <laughs> but, um, Here we are. <laughs> but I remember going into that little church and he uh, he actually just reached out to me. He was coming through Indy, and he said, hey, can we have lunch? And so we sat down and, and talked, and I was able to just thank him for mm-hmm. the way he protected me and invested in me and saw the best in me when I would make dumb decisions. But the associate pastor of that church, I was 24. The associate pastor was a guy named Bill Waller. I think he since passed away. Bill was, um, I believe, 71. Mm-hmm. So he was a retired truck driver who, while he drove a truck, would just memorize scripture. <laughs> And wow. then when he retired from truck driving, he just started serving in churches mm-hmm. and he was my associate pastor. And I just remember thinking like, <laughs> you know, the humility required of him yeah. to be able to do that. And I just mm-hmm. remember him pouring in and investing mm-hmm. into me. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, those people are, those types of people that we all have, I'm sure we could probably list mm-hmm. the names are, are uh, such God sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I think it should make us aware as leaders, who are we then investing into? Mm-hmm. Um, who are we calling out maybe before they see something Mm -hmm. before they see it in themselves we need to see it and Mm -hmm. call it out and speak it out so we have been in a series at church called among lions we've been walking through the old testament book of daniel Uh, we've got three more weeks left as of the recording of this podcast Mm -hmm. we may be almost done or or done by the time this airs Mm -hmm. but really um what we've been looking at is the fact that Daniel is a model and an inspiration for how to live for God within a godless culture. Mm-hmm. And it's really resonated pretty deeply with people in our church. I've gotten mm-hmm. lots of really good feedback from it. We've taught through Daniel before. Mm-hmm. I don't remember getting this good of mm-hmm. feedback. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I don't think that the preaching's gotten any better. <laughs> I think that probably the world in which we live, people are going, wow, this is like right where I'm at. Mm. And just the challenge of recognizing Daniel wasn't a prophet, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a pastor. Mm -hmm. He was um, in the marketplace, but actually more specifically, he was in government, which Mm -hmm. made it more tricky. And so, um, you know, you guys are in full-time ministry, just not necessarily vocationally. You're in the marketplace, God's using you there in significant ways. And so what are some of the challenges um, for representing Christ within a workplace, especially in the cultural environment and the times in which we live? Mm -hmm. And then what are some of the opportunities? I'd love just to talk about that, kick that around for a little bit. Yeah. Mm. So I think it's almost easier the earlier you are in your vocation career. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking when I was, you know, graduating from Purdue in 2001, Um, I had no idea what I didn't know. And Mm. three months after 9-11 happened. Mm. And so it was actually an interesting time professionally because there was a willingness for people to talk about their faith because Mm. like the whole world was trying to figure out what Mm -hmm. what to make of it. And so I just, I mean, I just did it. Like I didn't really feel like I had restraints. Mm. I just, I shared that with my peers and um, I was pretty honest and upfront about that. I think the more responsibility I had, so if I fast forward to our time in England, you know, I was the managing director, which is basically the CEO of a $75 million business unit. I was 35, I was female, I was American, Mm. and it was my first time leading people. What could go wrong? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) um, yeah, talk about a lion's den. And you know, the, the, the culture in England professionally, also too for females, is about 10 years behind the US, and so, Hmm. I just had this enormous amount of pressure Mm -hmm. and couldn't quite figure out how to be my authentic true self as a leader in the workplace without feeling like the daggers would just come every which angle. Mm -hmm. And I think now, you know, six, seven years later, I look back on that experience and I'm grateful for it, but it's given me an opportunity to the, the next time and the next time and the next time I was a people leader in an executive role doing it differently Hmm. right so i'll just say that um with i think more responsibility comes more pressure but it's also an opportunity to shine brighter for the lord Hmm. and i think you as as leaders i i'm not going to speak for everyone i had to decide and i continue to decide every single day Hmm. am i going to be my authentic true Hmm. self with christ as my identity or am i going to try to conform to this world Hmm. 
And um, for me, it's just come with a lot of trial and error and a lot of experience, a lot of time. Mm-hmm. So. Mm. so it's interesting you bring that up. I was thinking about this power dynamic, this thing I'm learning now. So I sit in the president's seat now and used to be, I, I would tell you five years ago, I would lead more openly with, here's what I believe, more direct, more, mm. more uh, spoken word. And I used to be able to give this advice really well to the person in charge. Mm. Hey, you can't see yourself as a member of the team. As much as, as humble as you are and as mm. authentic as you're being, you still have a power seat um, and it's invisible to you. Well, now I'm in that mm. seat and I've been struggling to see that if I lead with those belief, that belief system, I can almost be oppressing with it. Mm-hmm. And so now there's this challenge. Unintentionally. Unintentionally, right. Mm-hmm. right. Yeah. I, I'm trying to be, I'm just one of the guys or one of the team. Mm. But if you lead that way, it can be almost an unforeseen pressure on top of someone. And so now I'm, I'm trying to lean in a little bit differently and say, I'm going to react to things differently. I'm going to mm-hmm. invite someone to ask me the question. The mm-hmm. second they, answer, they ask the question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run in. But I'm trying not to lead so openly with it because it feels like the power dynamic has shifted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough because I like like leading. I, I don't hold much back. I'm pretty transparent. If you ask anybody, I, I kind of will just tell you everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to learn to temper that. That's the new growth for me is I can't lead in like that so hard mm-hmm. that I push somebody into a bad power dynamic. Yeah. And it's that's a hard lesson for me. Yeah. And I think, and I don't know if this has been your experience, but I'm, I'm sure all three of you could speak to this. You lead and unintentionally, you're just being yourself, but people put expectation on you as a leader in all kinds of ways that like, you're like, well, I never said that or I never did that, but they put that expectation on you. And so managing that's a whole other level of complexity. Right. Mm. That, in my opinion, is the hardest part of leadership. Mm. Yeah. I I think that that's been, it's those um, either unspoken or unmet expectations that people have towards you as a leader. Mm. And I'm trying to learn now to ask for them. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to be like, hey, what are, what are your expectations? Or what, what do you need from me? And let's articulate that. Because I think that um, I've had this happen so many times where there was an, uh, a sort of an unspoken expectation from somebody that reported to me or whatever. And I didn't know it. And mm-hmm. I unintentionally offended by something I said, most of the time it's by something I didn't do or say because mm-hmm. I'm mm-hmm. relatively reserved as a person. And then it just festered. Mm. Yeah. By the time I found out about it, it was a full on infection and yeah. we couldn't get it back. Mm. That's really challenging, but really insightful. Have you had Tony, like any kind of experiences on that, that you could share without necessarily details and maybe mm-hmm. some things that I'm kind of putting you on the spot yeah. with that, mm-hmm. but, yeah. but some things that maybe you've learned. Mm. Yeah. So, so many things. <laughs> um, You know, I, when I was, when I was leading in the UK, um, I didn't ask for that job. Mm. I didn't ask for that promotion, right? Mm. Somebody above me and a number of people thought, you know what, she's ready for it. Mm. Um, I didn't know that there had been a couple individuals who would now be reporting to me who had to raise their hands in one of that job oh, multiple that's times. Fun. That's yeah. fun. I can see where this is going. <laughs> um, and they didn't hold back in terms of their dissatisfaction with, with who I was mm. and who I was as a leader. And mm. so, um, you know, as every Enneagram three, uh, does you try and like make everyone else mm. happy and please them as their leader and try and meet their needs. And I just got to a point where I was like, regardless of what I do, it will never be enough. Mm. And, and so I just had to have some direct and hard conversations. I wish I could say that I walked away from that relationship, like everything was healed and mm-hmm. you know, we were great and it didn't, it didn't happen. There was just never any closure mm-hmm. and the wound was pretty deep. Mm-hmm. Um, now there were other, there are other individuals on the team who were like, you're the best leader I've ever mm-hmm. had. And so, you know, you're trying to balance this dichotomy of like, how can I be the best leader someone's ever had mm-hmm. or multiple people, but this individual thinks that I'm like mm-hmm. out to get them or yeah. I'm the worst. Right. Mm-hmm. So I got to this place where it was, I will never be able to make every single person happy. I will never be able to mm-hmm. lead perfectly. Mm-hmm. I just have to lead true and authentic to what the Holy Spirit and how God's leading me in this season or in this moment or in this in this role and just recognize that there's just some people who I won't ever make happy or, or won't ever reconcile with. Mm-hmm. And that was really, really hard, mm-hmm. but I think it's helped inform even just the, the day-to-day now, you know, mm-hmm. even little little things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 
in, in life. So, yeah. Oh man, I, I could, de- I can so resonate with everything <laughs> you just said. Yeah. I, I, there've been times whenever, cause I think even in this role, once again, I never really asked for it or wanted mm-hmm. it. I kind of went into ministry kicking and screaming yeah. and I never thought that I would be in this t- kind of environment that we're in. And what I've sort of found, and Ryan, I know you get a lot of this as well, is that usually there's very few people that are just sort of like middle of the road with me. Mm -hmm. It's either, um, man, you walk on water, Mm -hmm. which I know is not true. My Mm -hmm. wife knows it's not true. The people that are closest to me know that it's not Mm -hmm. true. Or... I think you're the antichrist. <laughs> and there've been times whenever I'll come home and like, I'll get an email mm-hmm. from both and I'll look at Lindsay and I'm like, I don't even know who I am. Like, who am I? Yeah. Like, this is so disorienting when you're getting that drastically of different of feedback. Mm-hmm. And, uh, as you're, and I'm an Enneagram three as well. Mm-hmm. It's, I will lead with, I'll, I'll lead with the boldness of a prophet mm-hmm. and then go home at night and lick my wounds mm-hmm. as a pastor, like a shepherd. Like mm-hmm. I'm just, you know, cause I'm so deeply concerned for people. And, um, those are the moments that I think get really taxing as a leader and that you really have to watch, um, your own mental and emotional health yeah. because it can be such a grind on you mm-hmm. and you want to lead from a very healthy place. I love what you mm-hmm. said. Like, you're never going to make everybody happy. That's really not the goal of leadership. But everybody needs to know that you care. Everybody needs to know that you're willing to hear, that they have a voice with you. Uh, but at the end of the day, like you've got to make a decision and not everybody's going to like it. And yeah. you've got to operate out of a healthy place. Yeah, just to add to that, I'm a three also, so not to be outdone by the other two threes on the panel. Um, <laughs> three threes and a nine. <laughs> Here we are. I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the end result of that, Aaron, is that imposter syndrome. So if you really build your, mm. your worth on what people say about you, you'll, you'll live by their compliments and die by their criticism. And Uh-oh. so like you, it's that, that imposter syndrome. And, and I'm saying this as a guy that self suffers and will sometimes say like, man, am I the guy? Mm-hmm. Mm. And maybe this is, maybe the role's too big for me or the leadership task is too, too great. And, mm. you know, I sat on another conversation, just said, I'm what you call a reluctant leader. Mm. I can usually see the thing that needs to be done. Mm. And I'm looking around going, why isn't anybody doing it? Mm. Yeah. And so then I jump in. And so I, I never have the desire to be, hey, one day when I grow up, I'm going to be the CEO or I'm going to be the guy. Mm-hmm. Just be in the middle of a conversation. I'm like, mm-hmm. why isn't anyone doing the thing? Mm-hmm. I think God gave me the gift of seeing yeah. the thing. Yeah. And so now it's up to me to use it, right? For yeah. The, You're a forward thinking leader. You see right. out, out the windshield. Right. I'm always like, who's got time for the present, man? We right. got to live in the future. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly yeah. right. And so you're, you're usually the first to see that kind of a stuff. But yeah, yeah I've heard it was, a, it was a mentor of mine who said, if you are constantly, uh, and this was through the lens of preaching, if you're preaching for the accolades of, of people, mm. then you'll go home every Sunday afternoon and die a thousand deaths. Yeah. And I was just, yeah, that was so true. There have been so many Sunday afternoons where I just go home. It's like so lonely. Mm. And I'm just like, dying inside yeah. mm-hmm. you know or I'll, I'll i'll literally like think about i've heard andy stanley talk about this too where i'll just literally think about something i said in a sermon where i messed it up mm-hmm. and i forgot but then it comes to mind and i'm, I'll, I'm just like oh you know it's like, <laughs> Lindsay's like what are you doing i'm just like i'm just like recalling how i messed that up <laughs> yep and you just got to learn to let that stuff let go. It go yeah mm-hmm. and i going back to daniel the the verse that i just like can't get out of my head was um this past week and chapter six, verse four, like the high officials, like couldn't find anything mm-hmm. to criticize or crazy? condemn yeah. him about, like yeah. couldn't find a thing. Mm-hmm. And so back to this whole, like living like Daniel in the, in the world, in the marketplace or in whatever context you live in, like that can feel like a lot of pressure too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like how beautiful that, like even his enemies saw him consistently reliable and trustworthy. <sighs> and it's like, your his identity was in the Lord, mm-hmm. like over and over and over again, mm-hmm. and you know three kingdoms came mm-hmm. and went in his whatever sixty plus years, and yet he was so consistently yeah. rooted in that identity, yeah. and yeah. like mm-hmm. that's something to aspire to. Yes, like yeah. no criticism or condemnation at all. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. that feels like Jesus. Mm. Absolutely, you and know? I think that's kind of a key. And this is where you know I don't know that Ryan and I could speak to this as effectively as you guys because mm. you know we're pastors. Mm. Sometimes I wish that I, actually some of my favorite conversations are with people who have no idea who I am, mm. and on an airplane or whatever. Yeah. I just love that it, it, to stay sort of like anonymous vocationally mm-hmm. at least for as long as I can because as soon as you say pastor, all kind of, you just never know what, yeah. what lens by which they see you after that. But I think um, it's this tension 
um, that exists between all of us. I think there's probably a lot of people listening to this thinking to themselves, whatever context they're in. Um, my neighborhood group, the community mm-hmm. thing that I'm a part of, you know, where I'm rubbing shoulders with non-Christians, mm-hmm. how do I live out my faith? And mm-hmm. I think that a lot of people think, well, I just, I don't know that I know enough. Mm-hmm. And it's not about that. And then a lot of times it's like, well, let me slip you some testaments, you know, <laughs> you know, let me try to, you know, give you a little pamphlet and try to kind of push this and proselytize on you. And that can feel, you know, so mm-hmm. inauthentic. Uh, or you can go the other way, and I've heard this a lot. I, I kind of made a joke about this a couple weeks ago. I don't think it fell flat. I, I think I don't think I used it the next service, but something about like, well, I'll just let my actions be my witness, mm-hmm. you know. And I just want—I don't have to ever say anything at all. Mm-hmm. So this is this tension. Mm-hmm. I think the more effective thing can be like Daniel. The people that you're working with, they're just like, man, I know that they're not perfect as mm-hmm. a leader. But wow, um, mm. they're so real and authentic, mm-hmm. and there's something so tangibly different mm-hmm. about the way that they carry themselves. Mm-hmm. And it's not even about, um, you know, whether or not you are a. I mean, boy, in the cultural environment that we live right now, we just see. Le- I mean, it's <laughs> it's hunting season for mm-hmm. leaders. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. You just walk through Twitter. Mm-hmm. You know, you just see all this stuff where, and many of much of it, maybe rightfully so. Mm-hmm. Some of it probably not because I think people are imposing some of their hurts onto maybe current leaders that have nothing to do with this. There's a lot of skepticism right now. Mm -hmm. And I think as leaders, if we can be like Jesus and Mm -hmm. like Daniel Mm -hmm. and just be as above reproach as we can and to to the point where the people that are working for us, with us and around us go, man, what is it that's so different about Mm -hmm. you? And that takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think it's the more effective way to go about this rather than, hey, hey, sit down in my office. Let me tell you what I believe. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think you got to be good at what you're doing, too. Mm. So what I love uh, in the verse you're reading is like he also performed. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And so through. you don't have to just be this watered down soft person. Mm. Um, the other side of it is you earn some respect by performing well. Mm. Yeah. You're the kind of teammate people want to have on your on their team. Mm. Which means... Show up on time. Show up on time. Do, do what you say you're going to do. Work the, work, get the work done. Like, yeah. I say to do ratio. If you said it, do it. Like, that's mm-hmm. the way you build trust. So before people, like, are going to listen to any of the stuff you might be preaching, they've mm-hmm. got to trust who you are. And so that you've got to perform as well. I mean, mm-hmm. don't show up soft. Mm-hmm. Come bring your A game mm-hmm. and, and, and kind of prove it yeah. al- along the way. And that will build trust as well. So, mm-hmm. yeah. That's so good. Yeah, my husband taught me that whole consistency thing. Mm. Um, because had I been left to my own devices, it's like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Like, let's go do this. Or, you know, mm. I might go to that meeting. Or, And I think what I've seen um, with with him is that not just even in, in our relationship and our marriage, but like even in his work context. I mean, he's spent years on the couch being my counselor, being mm. my leadership mm-hmm. coach and mentor. And, you know, the, the thing I've learned just by watching him, but also learning from him is that consistency. Mm -hmm. And then when you're, you're leading people, like I went into people leadership and, and thinking, well, everyone performs at the same level. Everyone Mm -hmm. has the same work ethic. Like Mm -hmm. everyone has the same intellect Mm -hmm. and talent and capabilities to do whatever job they have well. And that was kind of eye opening for me. Like actually no like Mm -hmm. people don't show up the same way Mm -hmm. and obviously like we're all created so uniquely differently Mm -hmm. um but i think we can make those assumptions of just because i show up and i work hard and i'm consistent that everyone in in my team everyone in my organization does the same thing Mm -hmm. and not that they're right or you're wrong or you're better a better leader but then how do you shift that when you're in an organization or you're in a team or you're working with people to say like, how can I value them and help them feel seen and encourage them and lead them and pull out the best in what they're Mm -hmm. capable of doing, Mm -hmm. knowing we all have to do things that none of us like doing. Mm -hmm. Um, And what does that look like? And Mm -hmm. I think that's, that to me is where the beauty really comes Mm -hmm. in and leadership is like, how do I empower and how do I equip? Mm -hmm. Um, How do I encourage these skills and capabilities that someone might be showcasing Mm. that aren't maybe even on their job description, Mm -hmm. right? And then how do I consistently show up and even show them the things that I don't like doing and I'm willing to do them? That's so good. And I think it brings up something that I'm really curious about getting both of your opinions on is how do you um, know when it's time to part ways with a staff person or Mm. somebody on your team? So it's like um, uh, lack of self-awareness. 
Mm-hmm. Like you're saying it, they're not hearing it, they're mm-hmm. not getting it. Mm-hmm. Um, you've brought it to their attention before. You've put them on some sort of a you know performance mm-hmm. plan or whatever. And then, uh, hey, it's time to part ways. And this is a lot of what we end up seeing, like on Twitter and these types of spaces, yeah. is, hey, I got the shaft at that place. They didn't mm. treat me well. Right. And uh, could be, that could be the case. But how do you know? Because uh, I'm, a, I'm imagining that you all believe the best in people. Yeah. Like, I, I, I probably, I'm more of a, I believe, I meet somebody, I believe the absolute best. Like, we're at 100% with mm. each other. And then, uh, you would maybe have to prove me wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm not starting you at 50% mm-hmm. saying, hey, prove yourself. And so there's probably been times when I've gotten burned because mm-hmm. I'm like, no, no, you know, we can bring them along. We can bring mm-hmm. them along. We can bring them along. And almost always whenever we've needed to part ways with somebody and I've known it and then we finally do, I'm like, man, we should have done that a while ago yeah. mm-hmm. because it was actually hurting other people. So what are, what are some ways that you hold your team accountable to results without it getting personal mm. or where they would maybe be blindsided by a decision that you make? Mm. Such a good question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you the conversation that we're having kind of ongoing. I, I, everybody in the building has heard me say this. I think we're a pretty conflict adverse group. Um, well, yeah, I, a lot I, of people are. I'm not, <laughs> which can get you know, mm-hmm. a bad rap sometimes, but um, I'd rather have it direct. And so I've, I've been pitching this analogy of like conflicts like this stuff that goes in a bucket. Mm-hmm. And so if you wait for your bucket to overflow, you're probably going to make an emotional, rash, unwise decision. Mm-hmm. You need to um, empty the bucket every day. Mm-hmm. And so if I've got direct conflict with Tony, it needs to be empty today mm-hmm. so that we a- address it directly. Because if we left, you said fester, mm-hmm. that's the right thing. It, it kind of just overflows and gets on your shoes and just makes a mm-hmm. nasty mess. And mm-hmm. if you wait for it to overflow, you're letting it control you versus taking the control of the conflict. Conflict's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of no. times it can, it can lead mm. to creativity great, great innovation yeah. and, and lots of other stuff. Um, and we should always be able to have conflict about the process. As long as we're not talking about someone's character, mm. you, we can argue. When we enter a conversation, we're equals. And so we ought to be able to argue about the process um, to, at, to the highest level until it hits someone's character. When mm-hmm. it hits character, then we need to check out. But we've been really talking about this idea that conflict goes in the bucket. Mm. You need to empty your bucket every day. Mm. Yep. If, you, if you wait for it to overflow... It just never goes well. Yeah, mm. the analogy we've used on staff is um, hooks mm. all, or question marks always turn into hooks. Mm. Yeah, that's good. So it's like if I've got a question about my interaction with you, I don't know that Tony. I don't know if I can trust Tony. Mm. Yeah. Why did Tony say that? Why is mm. she looking at me like that right now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, you're looking at me just fine. <laughs> but um, but it, but I've got, I've got a question mark. Right. I need to go follow that person down the hallway into their office and say, Hey, I got a question. I don't want it to turn into a hook. Mm-hmm that's gonna snag our relationship because it will in the future. Can we clear it? Uh, Dave Ryder, our leadership coach Mm -hmm. on staff, he always just says, keep clean accounts, which is what you're talking about, Mm -hmm. clean the bucket. Hey, I just gotta get this out on the table. And when we can manage to have like really healthy conflict, like in the moment as it comes up, like I love fighting with our team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not this fighting, we've never done that. Uh, Not dirty fighting, not angry Mm -hmm. emotional fighting, but just honest like fighting. And then we can actually walk out of the room and like still be like really good friends and cutting up. That just Mm -hmm. feels so good to Mm -hmm. me because it feels real, it feels vulnerable. You're not walking away going, hey, I I think that maybe they're probably going to somebody else and having a meeting behind the meeting and Mm -hmm. and this is gonna turn into a thing. Because if there's anything as a leader that is really frustrating to me is when there's an issue and it could have been brought to me and we could have talked about it and, and it just didn't happen. And then weeks, months, sometimes years go by, and then all of a sudden it overflows, gets mm-hmm. all over you. Mm-hmm. And I think you all called it the last ten percent, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like yeah. 10%. What's the last ten percent? Um, what are you withholding right, right now mm-hmm. due to fear and anxiety? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I've learned to ask this question: Hey, anything bothering you right now? Mm-hmm. Are you enjoying what you're doing? Mm-hmm. And uh, if not, um, what is it? You know, I'd love mm-hmm. to talk yeah. about it. I'd love to find out. Mm-hmm. Tony, what about you? Yeah, I think mm-hmm. there's often a point where you know it's too long. Mm. Like, yeah. so there's there's the addressing. I love what you said about addressing it in the moment, Jason, because that is, that is where I think the crack starts to become a canyon, mm-hmm. right? Is like, if it's not addressed, there is a point, I think, where you know and mm-hmm. they know, um, but no one wants to have the hard conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think in those environments for me, um, you have to you have to put time in and i've learned over and over again if i walk into a position or a role or leading a team and someone's like you need to fire this person this Mm. person this person i'm like listen they've just had a major transition Mm. i don't know this individual so i give it time Mm. and i invest in the relationship 
and I look at their track record, but I also understand like, how are they wired? What's the role that I need them to do mm-hmm. or have they been asked to do? Mm-hmm. And, and then give them the time and the opportunity to show whether they're capable mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And if not, then it's, Hey, you know, here's, here's what was asked of you. Here's the conversations we had and here's where we're just not getting there. Mm-hmm. Right. And so in a healthy way, in fact, the best conversations, exit conversations I've had is like, you tell me whether or not this mm. is where you want to be long term, or what kind of a role do you want here, mm. and then have a dialogue to say, is that possible? Mm. Is that possible for you here? Um, I've also been a part of organizations where it gets shoved and shoved and shoved under mm-hmm. the rug, mm-hmm. and that leads to toxicity because no one's willing to like directly address a hard conversation, mm-hmm. and so that is a whole other level of, of, of conflict. But by not addressing it, it's actually, my opinion is it's actually worse mm-hmm. than having a hard exit conversation. No one wants to exit someone or, or at least start that dialogue. But I've also been in situations where I've, I've thought I've got someone who's not performing and I've come to give them an opportunity to shine in a different way and maybe taken some things off their plate, added mm-hmm. some things, and they become a superstar. Yeah. And I realized actually mm-hmm. this person was not set up for success in the role they were in, or they weren't guided or encouraged or empowered. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I think it's just a matter of like, the sooner you can in you as a leader, you tend to know mm-hmm. when it's time, mm-hmm. is, is, is intentionally in addressing it. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you don't, it's, it's gonna go one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And I think one of the real uh, differentiators in all of this, or the thing that's a game changer, let me say it that way. Like you just said, nobody wants to have the conversation about moving somebody off the team. We've Mm -hmm. taken great links to get the right people on the team. I want to love who I do what I do with. I don't Mm want to see anybody exit. Um, And I think that um, if we as a leader are, our motivation is the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Um, Wow. We need a profit. We need to be successful. We need to beat the competition in a church setting. We need to grow. We need to reach more people. We need to be mm-hmm. on mission. And so uh, uh, I'm going to intentionally or unintentionally use these people to accomplish the mission. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then our, our, where our motives are all off base. Mm-hmm. And then we're toxic as a leader. If, however, our viewpoint with everybody on our team is that is a unique person made by God, they've been gifted in a unique way, uh, a gift set that I don't have, we need them on the team, and they're struggling right now. And I gotta figure out as a leader why they're struggling. Is it a character thing? Mm -hmm. And we can address that. That may or may not mean they leave the team. Um, Are they willing to see it? Are they willing to own it? Is it a competency thing? Is it a misalignment thing? Mm -hmm. Because man, I really want the best for you. And if you come to this decision where you're like, you know what, I don't think that you're pursuing what God has really called you to do by staying on this team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't know that you have the courage to leave, to go do it, like you know, like Tony, like leaving a job mm-hmm. without a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let me try to help you and send you. And some of the best have been usually in those moments whenever you have to have that hard conversation with somebody and that they don't wanna see it, they don't see it, that's scary, you know, mm-hmm. this is painful. And I have had a few circle back and say, uh, former staff members just say, man, thank you for seeing what I couldn't see. Mm. Thank you for being gracious, taking care of me. Mm. I'm doing what God's asked me to do. I never would have got there. Yeah. Those are the best. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And it's, that's what you want for everything, but it's really tricky. Well, and I would say for a lot of folks listening to this, they may not be able to have the God conversation in right. that, in yeah. that discussion, yeah. right? Because yeah. of their, mm-hmm. hopefully if you're in a church, you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But for those of us that don't work in churches, you know, or by vocate, like a, a faith-based environment, Mm -hmm. you've got to toe a line there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think there's ways that you can have that conversation around your gifting, your talents, your capabilities, Mm -hmm. your purpose, your passion. Um, And maybe, maybe you know that they're Mm -hmm. a Christ follower and you can have that. But Mm -hmm. a lot of times you, you have to navigate that maybe a little bit differently. We we use the acronym GWC. They get it, want it and have capacity to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's an EOS term. It's similar to church OS that you guys use get it do they have the skill set mm-hmm. so did we get like do, can they do the thing yeah want it what's their passion like are they leaning in are they doing the hard work are they putting in their effort and then um capacity can mm-hmm. they actually functionally perform so mm-hmm. do they know what, what's expected are they putting in the work can they functionally perform and it's an old jim collins tag on did you get the right people on the bus and now are they in the right seats mm-hmm. um, i had one similar thing where i had to move on from a young lady and 
I perform all the terminations, uh, and I'm sick to my stomach every yeah. night before. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you ever get comfortable with that, you probably should not be leading people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it is a sickening feeling. And I, we were sitting down having the conversation of, hey, we've had this conversation for nine months. The role has changed. There, we've looked around the landscape. There's not another seat on the bus that your skills align with, mm -hmm. and it's time for you to move. And I, I walked into that conversation knowing she was going to need someone to be angry with. Mm. And, and, and I was willing, don't hear me as this martyr, but I was mm -hmm. willing for me to be that guy. Mm. And it took 18 months. 18 months later, we had lunch. She said, thank you for pushing me outside of my comfort zone because I'm plugged in exactly where I belong now. Mm. And it's been a great 18 months. No, that's good. Then she went on further to say, thank you for letting me be mad at you. Mm. Oh, awesome. And I was like, that's fantastic. Wow. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. Great, man. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think sometimes as leaders, in the marketplace, in a nonprofit, in a church envir environment, we underestimate the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I agree. Every conversation that I've had, like sick, sick feeling. Yeah. Mm. But I also, because I tried to try to be a Daniel, mm. go into those conversations prayerfully, like spending 15 minutes mm -hmm. beforehand. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, direct this conversation, open their heart and their mind to receive it. And even though they might be angry or they might be completely caught off guard, would you just allow there to be an openness to just move in this conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have seen time and time and time again, the Lord just show up Agreed. in ways, in ways they're like, well, yeah, actually, you know, mm -hmm. this is happening in my personal life, or I've actually been thinking about leaving. I'm, And then the conversation, all of a sudden I'm developing them and having right. a coaching career coaching conversation. Right. right? And so mm. don't underestimate the power that the Holy spirit will do in using you in those hard moments in those hard conversations. Cause because oftentimes the relationship can be even strengthened mm -hmm. while it will look very, very different if you're willing to go there. God, and that's a true in friendship and life. God can use that in really remarkable ways. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. A great book that comes to mind. We'll, we can put it in the show notes is by Henry Cloud, Necessary Endings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, if you haven't had a chance, if this topic interests you, you might get a hold of that book. And, mm. uh, th there are some endings that are necessary. Yeah. Um, and he uses, I think, the analogy of pruning yeah. and gardening, um, just so that it can be more fruitful. Mm. So, that's so good. Hey, as we kind of wrap up, um, uh, l tell us a little bit about, you know, a, a effective leader is going to be a healthy one. Mm -hmm. So what are some just daily routines, practices to make sure that you're emotionally and spiritually healthy? Yeah. So I, um, I'm very protective of my morning time. So I'm a yeah. pretty much get up at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 440, I, but I'm, who's counting? I mean, who's counting? I mean, tomorrow I'll be 438, <laughs> but it's fine. <laughs> so, so early on, I mean, I, I've learned that I need that 30 minutes with a cup of coffee and the Bible. Mm. And then I need to physically exercise. Mm -hmm. If I don't do both of those things, um, it's, I'm just not good for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And so I won't allow anyone to schedule anything before 8.30. Mm -hmm. And so it has cost me. I'm a guy that had some pride in showing up, being the first guy at the office, the last guy to leave. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned that to be healthy, I've got to kind of stay in those rhythms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't spend time with God, get my coffee and, and get a workout in, I'm just not really, I'm not healthy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the fallacy that I'll do it in the evening just never works because then I don't turn it off. And yeah. so I, I look up and it's six 30 at night and my wife's texting me like, Hey, it's time for dinner. Where you at? I'm like, Oh yeah, I didn't get the thing done. Mm. And you do that for a couple of days and all of a sudden you're just not a joy to be around. You're not mm -hmm. making good decisions. You're not, you know, so I've learned, uh, to set my pride aside a little bit mm -hmm. about being the first guy in the office. Yeah. And realize I've got to I've got to do these things to stay healthy. If I don't, I'm going to burn out. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's that's so good. Same, same, same. Mm. Um, and I was telling Ryan earlier, there's a there's a chair in in a couple mm. different rooms of my house. I've got a chair, and mm. um, that rhythm of just like that's where I sit, that's mm -hmm. where I spend time with the Lord and have coffee. Mm -hmm. That's 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 what mm -hmm. the day doesn't go well if it doesn't start for me that way. Mm -hmm. Um, the beauty of the season I'm in now owning my own business and setting my own schedule is like my favorite two words are slow morning. Mm -hmm. And so not everyone has this luxury, but I'm so grateful that I actually don't start before 9am, mm -hmm. which is kind of bonkers considering I was pre, you know, pre this season, on zooms at 7am with, mm -hmm. you know, my team in India and mm -hmm. Spain and wherever else around the world. 
um, and totally burnt to a crisp by five o'clock, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. but now it's a, it's a real slow intro and then I might work later in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I get that workout in and I have, you know, time with the Lord that can look like 30 to 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the best day is when I don't even watch the clock. Mm -hmm. Like I don't even know what time it is. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing is I am wired to be in relationship with just other women who are like-minded. And so, um, every other Thursday night, there's 10 women in my house and we're talking about the sermon series Mm -hmm. and we're doing life together. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I've also learned that because I own my own business and I'm by myself, I got to get out of my house a little bit. (laughs) And, um, and so that looks like having, you know, coffee a couple times a week with people and just Mm -hmm. intentionally connecting and, um, having, you know, leadership conversations, but with Christ followers to, mm. to continue to stay, mm. um, you know, fresh, but also mm. keep the curiosity, mm-hmm. um, and the creativity flowing. Yeah. So there's, there's something to be said about having leadership conversations that you don't have direct responsibility for. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. They oh, are yeah. so fruitful. Mm. It sharpens you. Like being able to, uh, lean in with, uh, Alex here on staff who said, mm. will you mentor me? I'm like, dude, I think you got the wrong guy. <laughs> um, I'm not that old guy, first of all, and I'm not that smart. I'm mildly intelligent, so this is probably not a good deal. But just being able to walk through some of the decisions he's making with his team. like, mm. And then every time I plug in with Allie, she says, well, do you have capacity? I'm like, you don't realize this is recharging for me. Yeah. Mm. So like in the middle of all the chaos of the things I am responsible for, yeah. to just be able to lean and be a yeah. friend and give some advice or give mm. some, even most of the time it's, here are the things I've screwed up. Mm-hmm. So like just do it the other way and it'll mm. probably be good. Sharing that information when, when you don't have direct responsibility for it is yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I love like coaching phone calls. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you know, I've told my assistant, I was like, if any pastor or ministry leader around the country wants a little bit of my time, the answer is always yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's just like a 20 minute phone call, whatever. And let me kind of speak into that. And sometimes like I'll get off that call and be like, I didn't even know I knew that. Like, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> it, because it kind of takes you around the, con- out of the immediate context that you're in and yeah. that helps. Yeah. And I love you guys talking about your daily routine. Another book that comes to mind, we can also put this in the show notes. I think it's written by Daniel Pink, but it's called When, W-H-E-N. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he just talks about the rhythms of your day. When are you the most productive and make mm-hmm. sure that the, your most important work gets put into that time. Cause I'm the same way. Lots of people ask me for breakfast meetings and I'm just like, I'm, 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 uh, I hate to do this, but like, no, the answer is always yeah. no to those. Yeah. Uh, because my mornings are so important to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that same thing. I get up quiet time with the Lord, uh, get a workout in, yeah. be there at the house and take one of my daughters to school. Yeah. And then I start my day. And usually, uh, that's when I'm the most clear headed mm-hmm. yep. and I, that's when I've got to write. Mm-hmm. That's when I got to do all my thinking work because largely what our church needs me to do is think. Mm-hmm. And so it's like thinking out, thinking about content, all of that. And and I don't start usually, but the earliest I'll ever start a meeting is about 11 o'clock. Yeah. Wow. And, and I, then I'm like in meetings from like maybe 11 to four or 30 or mm-hmm. so. Um, but though that's the time when I do that, but it's the thinking stuff that all mm-hmm. needs to happen in the morning for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, Ryan, I feel bad mm-hmm. because I feel like I've dominated this conversation no. and maybe I've presented um, a, a question mark in your mind that we need to then clear. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get five minutes with yeah, you? We after? Need no. To uh, to clear the toxic bucket. No right? hooks. No. No, hooks. no, you're just, yeah. you know, you're, you've just come off paternity sure, leave, man. Sure. Like, I, I know you got a lot to say to this subject because no. you lead people so well. No, I, I appreciate that. Uh, no, the conversation has been incredible. And yeah, the, the thing I would love to say is this. Um, you two are an inspiration. Like, I I hope that that's what's heard on the other side of this, of two people that have been leading at a really high level, not just in one area of their life. I think we see that sometimes of, for sure, you can be successful in the marketplace, but the the expense of family Mm -hmm. or church or anything that resembles balance. But what I love and been so inspired by you guys is just the level that you've run at, the executive level, but then also being invested into your family and then mm-hmm. fully engaged and invested in the church. Like I, mm-hmm. I just hope you guys see that and know that and hear that, that you guys are an inspiration. If they're modern day Daniels, it's you too. So thank you guys so much for sharing yeah, what you did you. and how you did it. I uh, love you both. Wow. Yeah, too, man. Thank you. Yeah. Well, man, that was a perfect, you came in at the <laughs> very <Yeah>. end. <laughs> Class. Solid you, you hit the three pointer to yeah. win the game. <laughs> so if there's yeah people will remember this podcast because of what you just said right there so no man uh yeah thank you guys i uh echo everything that uh, ryan just said appreciate mm-hmm. and love you both mm-hmm. and thank you guys for listening to this uh talk mm-hmm. and if you can share like subscribe this helps us to get the word out about this podcast and we will see you next time